God is love. And you may ask yourself, is, if God is, um, God is love, God is life, how can there be in his presence things that are inanimate? It's not possible because God gives life to everything that is in his presence. Nothing comes out of the mouth of God and is lifeless. Remember when Christ said that these words that I speak unto you are alive. That is the nature of God. Which brings us to the next question. If God is love, if God is life, if he gives everything that he touches life, where does the inanimate come from? Why is the earth a ball of stone and rock and dust? Why is the moon uh, barely lifeless? Why are most of the planets on our solar system bare? Why do they look like they are dead? Why does everything that is on earth, including human beings, look like they are dead? Most importantly, why do we die? Remember the story of Genesis when Adam and Eve they were told that they would die if they partook of the, of the fruit in the middle of the garden? Well, I believe that that was a reference becoming inanimate or to becoming to assuming the tangibility that human beings right now have because let's face it we are all wrapped up in flesh that starts aging backwards or rather aging back into lifelessness. The earth is in the same predicament. The earth is basically stone and dust. It's inanimate. That's why in the book of Revelation, after the end of the age of Christ, it is written that God shall arise and the earth shall not be able to withstand him. The earth, the earth shall flee in the presence of God. It is why in the end of the revelation it's written that there shall be a new earth and there shall be a new heaven. Why? Because of what we are on now is dying. It's inanimate. Though everything that is created is, is created before God with life. Something happened to the earth. And right now, it's in a position or in a state that cannot withstand the presence of a living God. And you wonder why we struggle so much to find breakthrough. You wonder why it seems so hard to access the presence of a God. Why? It takes so much to just dwell 
in the grace and in the power of God, why the anointing of God seems like it's not permanent, that it comes and goes. Why seasons, even good seasons, come and go. Now, I believe that to have a glimpse of what the earth and what our surrounding planets are supposed to look like, it's very important for all Christians to read. Um, there's a script that is usually counted. Um, it's usually um it's usually categorized as part of the law scripts and it's usually not um, part of the Bible. It was not one of the books that were qualified by the Catholic Church to be disseminated to the general population. But the name is the Apocryphon of John. I love it because everything that is in that book has life. It's what I would expect from God. I wouldn't expect that the earth would come from the breath of God in its dead state that we currently dwell on. That is impossible. God is life. How can he produce something that is dead? How can he produce something that is inanimate? Do you remember when um, the disciples of Christ were surprised about the miracles that he was doing? And he told them that if you have faith, you can speak to that mountain. And tell it to go into the ocean. Christ was referring and was cross referencing to an age when every mountain was alive. And just as an addition, I would recommend that you. Um, you visit a certain uh, a certain blogger, a certain vlogger on YouTube. His name is Roger, and I like his research. He's, he um, he works a lot on the electron flood theory, which um, he talks about the earth as being a living thing, somewhat living, or previously having more life than it does right now. And this he does using scientific experiments, actual scientific experiments. The name of the channel is called Mad Fossil University, as in Mad Fossil. He argues that um, the earth is littered with ancient giant creatures. And he's actually scooped some of the dirt and sent it to the best of the universities on this earth for DNA testing. Some of these giants are referred to in the book of Genesis. And our human mind cannot wrap around the idea of beings that are miles long, which um, uh, which is also referred to in the Genesis, because um, I believe um, Genesis referred to as the unit of measurement as an L, that some of these giants were Ls. So there's actually a, a figure that is quoted. I can't remember right now the exact verse. But it's referring to a length 
that seems beyond this world literally so roger is not so far from the truth and i believe that that is his purpose on this world he's also talking about um the earth being a generator it's a meeting um electrons or, le- or electricity he's explaining the law of gravity and a lot of things that will open your eyes to things about the earth and things about the planets that surround us that will make you believe the book of um the apocrypha of john as the universe having been literally literally alive with its own intelligence several um several beings having been created i don't know if they were in form of animals or in form of men but there's a lot of evidence out there to show that life is not what we've been taught that it is there was a time ago a few months ago when um it was big news amongst those people who are interested in this space that there was an asteroid that was feared to be um to have a probability of hitting the earth it wasn't so it was something that we haven't had before but what was strange about this asteroid was its shape and it was shaped like a skull there were demonstration demonstrations on the on the net on how the skull was looking like and it was looking like an actual skull this is an an asteroid that is floating in this space so it's important um to come to the realization of what the creation of god began as began as and also uh, through that to have a realization of the extent of the power that is created within us or, or is wrapped around our flesh and to know to what extent our limitations are upon this earth and our potential to because in as much as we are surrounded by death in as much as matter or the being of tangibility is um it's a stumbling block or some kind of a um some kind of a bondage that we have to live through it opens us up to what god intended for us because one thing that i've learned about um the apocryphon of john is that every being that um that god created had a purpose every being that he created had a special power and his creation was expanding was giving forth because that is the nature of god he does not create things that have no ability to replicate or to expand even the angelic powers continue to replicate 
that is what God does. It's the nature of God. That even his word, when he speaks it, it comes out as an actual princip- an actual principality, an actual angel. A principality is an angel. An angel that comes in the name, in the in the form of a power like love. Love is a principality. Peace, peace is a principality. That means it's a power that rules over a plane or a universe that has its all executory angels. That's why you should not waste your joy. When you realize that you have joy and you're in the midst of a battle, you should realize that it means that you have a visitation from an angel, from the plane, from the principality of joy. There's a visitation for you. And if it's in the midst of a struggle, it is coming with a sword to execute the purpose of God, to free you. I cannot tell you how many battles I've been fighting. And in the middle, in the middle of the battle, I will be flooded by joy and I will know that power has descended. The counsel for war has descended. It's like when um, the children of Israel were fighting their battles and um, they would ask the Lord, can we go forth and retaliate against them or can we go forth and attack them? And they would have to wait sometimes for days Sometimes they would have to undergo rituals, waiting for God to tell them, it's all right, go ahead, because if you go right now, I will be with you. That is what is called counsel for all. And in our age, you know that you are in the presence of counsel to win your battles, not just to fight, but to bring to desolation the army of your enemies. When God Almighty gives you or gives you access to the principality of peace or the principality of joy. Now remember, these are the characteristics of God that you'll find. In the New Testament, that God is love, God is joy, God is peace. These are principalities. They are angels. So realize that you're in the presence of greatness. When your presence, when you're in the presence of the characters of God. And don't be foolish enough to waste your peace, to exchange your peace for your ego or your joy for your ego that is foolish so um, the reason why I'm talking about the powers of God is the powers of the earth are bound because of the kind of curse that is surrounding, that has us in a form. Um, it's, a, it's a form of a prison. I don't know if it's just this universe, but um, wherever um, there's anything that is surrounding us that is um, not animate, that is bound by dust and by rock, um, you know that um, that demonstrates the absence of the life or the limitation of the life that the same proceeded out of God with. But there are also plans that did not proceed with God. 
This is also something that you will learn from the apocryphon of John. That there were planes that were created, universes that were created without the consent of God. These are the powers of darkness. Because by coming forth without um, without the life that emanates from God. Because they came out from one of the beings that God had created. They were not able to measure up to the holiness that was contained in the rest of the creation. They were not able to produce the same level of purity and of godliness that the rest of the creation was producing. So it is written that they had mischief that was born inside of them. They had evil that was born inside of them. So besides the planes or the universes that are surrounding us, there are planes or universes or principalities that that, that is the most correct way of calling them principalities that are full of mischief that were born with evil as part of their creation. The writings goes on to say that it was this um, it was this principality, it was the king of this principality that arose against the being that is currently part of the earth, that is currently um, the being out of which the earth and the surrounding um, planets was composed of. It is that evil principality that bound the spirit of the earth in the plane that we currently inhabit. So the book goes on to say that this was done by trickery. And it goes on to say that um, the binding uh, was for the purpose of usurping the powers of the spirit that that um, let me just uh, call it the spirit of the earth but uh, it's actually the earth let me just call it the earth what it is the purpose of the binding in the current cast that we actually um, are forced to inhabit with an inanimate and with a death and with the spirit of death um, came from that being, that creature that is called the dragon. Now, I know that is not far-fetched because um, in Revelation 1, God is talking to uh, when the Lord is talking to John, he tells him, do not hide anything. Do not use symbols and parables. So when God was using the, the dragons and when he was using the, uh, the creatures in the revelation, he was not hiding. He was not using symbols. He was not using parables. He was using the reality. And isn't it strange that John is speaking about the dragon and the, the apocryphon of John is referring to a dragon. This dragon is um, what came forth 
from um, the spirit of the earth. And it came forth without the consent of God. It came forth and embedded within its soul was sin and mischief. And the intention to multiply this sin and mischief not only on the earth but beyond. So, according to the Apocrypha of John, this dragon in the end rose against the earth and bound it where we are right now. So, to the famous answer of what is the devil or who is the devil, you now know The devil was not a creation of God. Well, he was a creation of a creation of God. So I guess he owes his existence to God too. The devil is a power that has many principalities that have been multiplying and continue to multiply from the day of his creation. You know why I believe that's true? Remember Christ when he was talking about going to heaven to prepare us a mansion, to prepare each of us mansion, mansions. I believe that there must have been something in the transliteration that did not capture the exact implication or the exact extent of a kind of uh, building that Christ was going to do. Because if you read the Apocryphon of John and realize that everything that was created had in it the ability to rip to replicate either in godliness from what was brought forth out of godliness. So there are planes or principalities that brought forth compassion. There are principalities that brought forth and within themselves make up what is called peace. These are millions of angels reigning over peace. Millions of angels reigning over joy. Millions of angels reigning over thanksgiving. Millions of angels reigning over the principality of mercy. And every good character, every good aspect of God is a principality with millions of angels that reign over it, that execute its purpose. Now, for this other creature, as I continue expounding on the apocryphon of John, for this other creature that was called the dragon, he, he actually had done a um, and a specific name that was used to refer to him. But he also reproduced extensive principalities. These are principalities that, of course, are not evil. But what I found more interesting is that in the process of expansion and in the process of taking power, there are some principalities that came out of the dragon that replicated the powers that had come from goodness and from God. Some of these powers were 
I believe compassion was one of them. I can't remember. But there are a parallel principality that has taken on characteristics that make them look like they are from God. Remember that Christ said that even the devil has transformed himself into a minister of righteousness. So taste all spirits. So just because there is goodness or what appears to be good doesn't necessarily mean that it's from God. This is where the testing of the spirits come in handy. Does it that does the spirit acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God? This is what one of the tests should be according to the Bible. Every spirit that is from God acknowledges that Christ is the Son of God. And I guess this also answers the big question about other new age in quotes, new age um, religions that seem to have everything rushes about them. There are also various religions, some of them that look very rushes, some of them acting even more rushes in quotes, than even the Christians do. As Christians, we've been accused of being the most unrighteous um, grouping of people. I hate using the word religion. But not everything that glitters is gold. I've told you the key what you need to examine. Does this spirit of righteousness acknowledge Jesus Christ? Some of them outrightly are against Christ. Some of them outrightly reject and declare Christ an enemy. That is the most important test. They deny that Christ was the Son of God. They deny that Jesus died and arose. There, there is your test. And whatever that does not accept Christ is not from Christ. So, I'll leave it there for today and encourage you all to go ahead and read the Apocryphon of John. I found it a very interesting piece of writing. I don't know about um, about a lot um, that happened before the creation of God or that happened in the heavens um, before the creation of man. But I think this is a good, um, it's a good place to start and I recommend it. 